Good afternoon, and please buckle up. We'll be taking you on a ride, a roller coaster ride. That of New York City's weather in the past, like, little over a year period, of where we've seen insane temperature swings throughout New York City. Normally, extreme temperature swings are supposed to be reserved for the Midwest United States without any moderating body to control temperatures. Here in the New York area, we have the Atlantic Ocean. However, the Atlantic is not as good as the Pacific is at moderating temperatures. And New York is still surrounded by land really on three sides. Um, so when you think about it, you know, our weather, we're not as landlocked as, I mean, as islandy as one might think. We're more landlocked than you think. And as such, we can get wild roller coaster swings. We were even beginning on one in January 2022. December 2021 wound up being the third warmest on record at New York City. And the month of January started off with a low of 50 degrees and a high of 56. After reaching 59 degrees the next day, the temperature plowed down to 37 degrees. While that 37 might not sound too significant, what we have to understand is that this began a month of below average temperatures. January wound up being 3.4 below average and the coldest since 2015. Fun fact, 2015's January was only 2.7 degrees below average. However, the normal January weather has been updated in the meantime. During this roller coaster, the rest of January after this did not touch the 50s in New York City. Some parts of the island, however, uh, got lucky on January 13th. Um, and of course, Newark would be hitting 50 more often. But what we have to understand is that during this time, there were in of itself wild temperature swings. Because after New York City hit the teens on January 4th, an icy commute that killed two people actually led to temperatures hitting the mid-40s on January 5th. But then there would be snow and between six and nine inches of snow falling on January 7th. And temperatures were back in the teens with a sub-freezing high on January 8th. And then it was back to rain on January 9th. This roller coaster would intensify as we saw a low of 14 degrees on January um, 11th, followed by temperatures of nearly 50 degrees on January 13th, followed by temperatures bottoming out at 10 degrees on January 15th, and the high that day was only 21. Yet it was 47 degrees and raining by January 17th, following 0.8 inches of snow. While that sounds meager, and it is, keep in mind it's more snow than what New York City has seen for this entire winter. Actually, the NWS Eastern Region just released a tweet for snow amounts, and, in, and of the NWS New York site, they range from 0.2 inches at JFK to 0.8 at Bridgeport. Very minuscule. Um, now... The roller coaster of weather does not um, end here because after temperatures yet again hit the mid 40s on January 19th, they were back down to around 15 degrees by January 21st. By January 26th to 31st, there was a six day cold wave which finally broke on February 1st. And February 4th saw it off as a mild and rainy morning with temperatures 57 degrees. But there was an ice storm on New York City's way, and in a single hour, the temp dropped from 54 down to 38. And would bottom out at, um, at 19 degrees on the morning of February 5th, with yet another sub-freezing high. The high that day was only 26. Uh, 27, I think. 26 was the low on February 4th as the front came crashing down. And yet, it was still a very raw and cold rain on February 7th in the aftermath of that. 
Now, the warmth would begin to build with temperatures hitting the beautiful mid-50s on February 10th and 11th. And on February 12th, temperatures would be even more beautiful, 59 degrees. While the morning low temperature was in the low 50s, the temperature would actually wind up dropping to um, 42 by midnight and would serve as a high on February 13th. 1.6 inches of snow came down and... Um, and you know, this meant that temperatures had to have dropped from 59 degrees down to around freezing. Parts of the island saw about four inches of snow, including where I live. Um, after that, temperatures slid down to 25, which would be the high on a very chilly Valentine's Day that dropped to 16 degrees. February 15th would also have the low of 16 degrees, but would warm up to 30 degrees. February um, 16th would have a low of 29 or 28 and a high of 49. The 49 low on February 17th would break a record for the warmest low temperature on a date, and the high of 68 on that date would tie a record for the warmest high. Yet highs would be back in the low 40s by February 19th. Then it would slowly climb back up until hitting 68 degrees on February 23rd. While some areas tied monthly records like Islip and Bridgeport, New York City failed to even set a daily record, and temperatures were back to being in the mid-30s by midnight, and continued to slide down to um, 29. The high the next day was a meager 35 degrees. And then it would be an ice storm on February 25th. The storm known as Winter Storm Oakley by the Weather Channel was known for doing that. It's dropping temperatures from record highs down uh, pretty much immediately into um, back to seasonable levels and then putting snow in the equation. And in some places, the drop was from the 60s to the, to the teens, like in Wichita Falls, Texas, or at Bangor in Maine. So it was an extreme drop. Now, our roller coaster is starting to enter into a calm period, but we do have to go up a vertical hill. March 4th had a chilly high low of 37.21, yet by March 6th, the high is a record tying 68, and on March 7th, the high is a record tying 74, with a low of 50 degrees, and severe storms also begin to plow through the area. <clears throat> Oh, and don't worry, March 8th would be a day of dropping temperatures, and by March 9th, it was a pretty raw day with 0.4 inches of snow and over an inch on parts of Long Island where the snow couldn't mix with the rain very well. And March 12th would also feature sleet, followed by March 13th having a high of only 35 and a low of 22. But don't worry, by March 18th, the high would be 74 again, and the low would be 50 again. Um, then we entered a rather warm week, although it wasn't always warm in that week. But then, of course, you know, as weather always has it, fate would come on a March 26th hailstorm. Hail is quite rare for the city, and on March 27th, a trace of snow was seen flying through the air as an arctic front came crashing down. By March 28th, the low had bottomed out at 23 degrees. But the high was 33 degrees, which broke a record for the coldest high ever on March 28th and became the coldest high temperature solely in the year since April 7th, 1982, had a high of 30 degrees, which was the latest date for a sub-freezing high ever, as well as tied for the coldest high ever in April. So, unlike May 30th, it was not the coldest high so late in the year, nor would it have been the coldest high in June had it been two days later. And yes, this is May 30th, 2021, not 2022. Just to clear up some ambiguity. And temperatures the next day would still be have a high of only 38 and a low of 24. The low of 24 at JFK broke a record, but at Central Park, the low for the date was only 10 degrees. 
Despite this, temperatures would hit the 60s on March 31st and then drop from April 1st into a high back of only 48 degrees on April 3rd. See how volatile New York City's weather was in 2022? It was exceptionally volatile and swingy. <clears throat> and I can't even like list every single up and down because if I did, this video would last for two hours. However, what we do have to understand is that from April 12th to 16th, the city would hit a high in the 70s every single day. After high temperatures were barely scraping 50 on April 10th. In parts of the metro area though, highs would be constrained to a still glamorous upper 60s on the 13th and 15th, but by the 16th, parts of the metro area were held to the mid 60s with varying clouds. The high hit 79 degrees on April 14th, but broke records, I mean tied records, when it hit 88 degrees at Newark and 73 degrees at Islip. Central Park was one degree away from its first high in the 80s, but because it failed to do so, it would have to wait another month and six days in order to reach this mark of being in the 80s. It was, it was a painful wait. Um, oh, and by the way, temperatures on April 16th, despite peaking at 73 degrees, would come crashing down to 44, and the high on Easter would be 51 degrees, low 41 degrees. Then between April 18th and 19th, the Northeast had dropped 2.1 inches of rain on the city, but it could not set a daily record due to it being split between two days. Still, it did close the southbound lanes of the major Deacon Expressway on I-87 from 3 a.m. to 9 a.m. After that, temperatures throughout the metro area that day peaked only in the low 50s, but they began to climb and then we would hit the 70s by, you know, April 22nd, Earth Day. It was a highly volatile period, um, but by late April into early May, we did see beautiful days with frosty lows in the 40s, yet <clears throat> highs peaking out in the 60s. But of course, on May 2nd, a, a bolt of lightning very loud woke the city up at 6.20 a.m. And that day, it would be stuck in the 50s. Um, so it would be a warmer night, yet a cool afternoon on both fronts. And that was kind of the mode for the next three days. But by May 5th, temperatures did then peak back in the 70s. But rain moved in on May 6th and by May 7th. There was a very crappy weather day with a high of 50 and a low of 45. While the low would remain constant on May 8th, the high would increase by 8 degrees. And it would not be so chilly in the afternoon again until late September, which is actually weird because usually early May is supposed to be a lot chillier than late September. But again, 2022, the year that Russia invades Ukraine, also has to have crazy weather. Not quite as bad as 2020, though. Remember, COVID was worse than the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Anyway, um, as we continue to proceed down this weather roller coaster, we would then see every single day begin to build on each other. And on May 11th in particular, the humidity spiked. Dew points went from being in the teens to being in the 50s and would soon hit the 60s and we'd start to see our first sticky weather of 2022 come into effect May 12th and remain in effect until May 16th. While the lows in parts of the metro did drop down to the upper 50s, the city managed to spend some nights in the 60s. Although, to be fair, this was one of the like later dates for this first occurrence. Not like one of the absolute latest, but it was still one of the later dates. Um, and we've seen that kind of pattern hold. Although I should probably first check and I'll make a YouTube short if I find out I'm an idiot and that we did in fact have a low in the 60s in April. Highly doubt that. Which is again be interesting given our lows of, in the 60s at the end of the year. Talk to you later about that. 
Um, now, May 19th would have a high of only 66 and a low of 53 as a rainstorm began to plow through New York City and dumped nearly an inch of rain. After March 7th Nor'easter, this is about the last thing that people in New York City wanted, another dreary May day. Though it did come after two days with highs in the 70s, with rather cool lows in the 50s. But <clears throat> on May 20th, a heat wave from the southeast began to creep up on New York City's doorstep. And temperatures had already hit 90 degrees in Baltimore that day, a sign that a heat wave was right on New York City's doorstep. Still, the high could only reach 69 degrees in New York City after a low of 51. So there was really nothing, or maybe the low is 52. Still, there was really nothing for New York Cityers to worry about yet. But a thunderstorm moved through at 4 p.m., which instantly changed the game and added thick humidity into the air. <clears throat> the low would be 62 degrees on May 21st. But the highway then shoot up to 90 degrees, record tying an ice slip, but not at Central Park. Still, the low of 62 was the chilliest low on a day that hit 90 since April 7, 2010, hit 92 after a low of 56. Still, the air was thick with humidity as dew points did hit 70 degrees later in the afternoon, producing a disgusting heat index in the mid 90s. Me and my family went to Jones Beach to escape the heat, where it was actually a rather chilly 72 degrees. Winds off the water were strong, water temperature was only about 55 degrees, and people did get cold shocks when they tried to go in the water to cool themselves down. That, and also you really couldn't go in the ocean yet because there were no lifeguards, which we different on the May 31st heat snap. This heat snap was also more lasting because the low on May 22nd was 72 degrees. The first low in the 70s of the year and perhaps, you know, even more interestingly, that was a record-breaking low of 72 degrees. But the high of 89 would fail to break the record. And high temperatures would fall back into the 70s on May 23rd and into the 60s on May 24th. But then May 25th saw a high of 70 and a low of 53, even if the rest of the metro area had a high of 66 and a low of 50. So on both accounts, it was, you know, four degrees warmer in the city than in the metro, but knowing for this to be evenly dispersed is rather rare. May 26th, we see that touch of humidity come back, and by May 27th, temperatures were back into the 80s, but barely. And on May 28th, there will be a high of 74 and a low of 63 as thunderstorms began to rock the city turbulently. But they would eventually clear out, and by May 29th, the high would hit 77 after a low of 59. This will be one of the last lows in the 50s for quite a while, because May 30th, we wound up hitting 84 degrees, the hottest Memorial Day since 2015. But unlike Memorial Day 2015, the cold would not be on its way very shortly. Instead, 93 degrees was recorded on May 31st, the hottest temperature so early in the year since April 17, 2002, hit a record tying 96 degrees, record tying for the warmest high throughout all of April, not just on April 17th. It was disgusting, but it couldn't even set a daily record in Central Park, although it could in some parts of the metro area. Places that had no AC were forced to give, um, were forced to release school early because of the dangerous heat, but dew points were only about 60 degrees, <coughs> which made it somewhat more bearable um, as compared to if the dew points were even higher. Then a backdoor cold front came in. It dropped Boston from 82 to 63, in just 10 minutes, and there was a point that night where it was 85 at LaGuardia, and yet 66 at JFK, as the back to a cold front worked its way through. Lows would drop to 60 to open up June, and highs were only 72, but it was more pronounced where I live near Farmingdale, where we had a high of 66 and a low of 58. Typically, the further east you were, the more it mattered, because some areas were still dealing with highs 
in the 90s before a storm moved through on June 2nd that actually dropped tornadoes in South Dakota that came to give a more pronounced cool down and more glamorous weather on June 4th and 5th. That saw highs in the upper 70s to low 80s and on June 5th, one of New York City's four lows in the 50s throughout the month of June. June would open up to be quite warm, but it would cool down later on. But first, mini heat wave, or at least here, it was a taste of that from June 8th to 10th as we hit the 80s on every single day. Central Park would have a cooler high than um, Long Island on all three days, which is very rare for three days in a row. On June 9th, temperatures in Central Park would hit the low 80s after a, a pretty violent storm rocked the area in the morning, and humidity would also drop significantly. However, more wet weather and dreary days were on their way for June. But before that, June 13th to 15th had a high in the 80s on every single day. But that three-day, like, mini 80s heat wave um, would be three weeks later than when this normally happens. June 16th would fall back to the low 70s thanks to rain. But then the high would shoot up to 88 degrees on June 17th. However, after the temperature held to 64 degrees, I mean, the 74 degrees at midnight, the low that day was in the upper 60s, the temperature would fall down violently through June 18th, spending the afternoon in the 60s before dropping to 58 degrees. The low would then bottom out at 54 degrees on June 19th, which would, and that low of 56 at LaGuardia, by the way, record time. But at Central Park, it was no such record. It was still quite far off of it. The high would hit 73 as skies became a lot sunnier, but the low would still fall back to the 50s on June 20th for the final time in spring. June 21st would feel cool, but it really wasn't. The metro had lows in the upper 50s and highs in the upper 70s, whereas in the city, the, it, the low was in the low 60s with highs in the low 80s. But it must have felt cool due to thick clouds, which would keep New York City stuck in the 60s all day on June 22nd. No records, but the high was 67 and the low was 62. June 24th was the end of this week of below average temperatures, with a high of 81 and a low of 63. However, combined with 66 degree dew points and the fact that the skies were clear this time, there was a noticeable difference in how it actually felt. The answer, a lot hotter. Um, heading into June 25th, there was um, a, the first high in the 90s for the month of June. After we thought that for the first time since 2016 we could escape June without a single high in the 90s, we were unfortunately proven wrong. That next morning had a high of 89 and a low of 74, which made it the only low in the 70s during June. You might think that New York City would get spared with lows in the 70s. You would be wrong to think that, but <clears throat> the, um, the way the weather worked out, it, it made you think that at that time. Then on June 27th, more severe storms throughout the area, and June 28th would be the last day until August 1st, to see a high in the 70s. On June 29th, the high would hit the 80s with a high of 84 degrees. It would be 85 degrees or higher every day from June 30th through July 6th, which at the time would become the longest streak since June 2020, but that would be a, become a baby streak rather soon. There's only a meager one high in the 90s during that streak when it hit 91 degrees on July 1st. And July would open up with three days with lows of 73 degrees. I can tell you that even when the lows hit the 70s in New York City, before July 2nd, the highs, I mean, no, 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 the lows here, that's what I'm going to say, the lows here would still be in the, um, in the, um, in the 60s. But yeah... Playtime was over, or at least so it seemed. But it really was over because July's temperatures in New York City were actually rather stable. 
I mean, it did hit the 80s on every single day. And the coolest low during all of July was 65 degrees. 24 days would have lows in the 70s. 10 days, highs in the 90s. There would be some rather volatile and interesting swings, however. But a lot of them just go a lot deeper than where you think they are. Like, for example, when on July 21st, it peaked at 92 degrees early in the morning, tumbled down to 74 degrees in the afternoon, but then wound up peaking back at 91 degrees in the early evening and maintaining 88 degrees at 8, 11 p.m. That is the kind of swings that we're talking about. New York City was engulfed in a six-day heat wave from July 19th to 24th. And it was interesting because the coolest high of the month was the day before the heat wave, July 18th, and two days after the heat wave was over, July 26th. Um, July 18th would also be the last day of the month with a low in the 60s with the, when the low was 69 degrees. The next time the low would be in the 60s would be on August 1st. So let's talk about that. After a high in the mid-80s and a low in the low 70s on July 31st, August was here to bring its biggest shower on August 1st. Temps dropped to 68, highs 77. Our camp group was taking a 9.45 a.m. flight to L.A. that got postponed to 10.17 a.m. thanks to this um, storm. And... It would really just prove to be, you know, the end of a disappointing streak where after that, highs hit 87 degrees or higher for the next 10 days. Lows during the next 11 days would be in the 70s as highs across these next 11 days would be 85 or higher. Um, there would be a four-day heat wave mixed in here. And had the highs on August 3rd and 5th been one day ha higher, it would have been an 8-day heat wave. Philadelphia saw a 10-day heat wave. And yes, highs did jump back to 90 degrees on August 2nd. After this rather stable period, this so-called fall preview came to New York City. But it would never come to be as it became the third hottest August on record in New York City. A lot of times the high was a lot higher than predicted. During this cool down, and on August 12th, the, pro the proclaimed first day, it might have felt like autumn thinks the humidity dropping significantly, but the low was still 71 and the high was still 85. That being said, it was a lot cooler the further east you went, thanks to the urban heat island effect. It was also dry enough, the air, that I got to spend a few nights without my AC on, which was nice and good for the electricity bill. The high would also fall back to 79 degrees by August 13th. Um, and the coolest temperature of August would also occur during this time, 62 on August 18th. But the high would then jump back up to 87. And while the final day of this fall preview is proclaimed to be August 18th, that's bullcrap because they're only saying that because... It was the last day with a low in the 60s, and it was still 69 degrees. Highs would hit 90s on the 19th and on the 20th. <clears throat> I was upstate, um, not upstate, I was in, on vacation in Montreal on the 19th, and it was still 29 degrees Celsius or 85 degrees Fahrenheit while in Montreal. And when we went to Vermont the next day, we thought that we were escaping the heat, but we weren't because temperatures of 90 degrees followed us in Middlebury, Vermont. Oh, and the next day, the high of 87 would follow both in this New York metro area, the not so far Central Park's high, and in the Green Mountain National Forest, making it an uncomfortable hike. Don't worry, though, Central Park, you'd have a high in the 70s on August 23rd, but you would also have a low in the 70s. It was supposed to storm violently, but violent storms did not materialize, which was actually bad for the drought. There would then be two days in a row with highs in the 90s on August 24th and 25th. The high would cool back down to 87 on the 26th, but jump back to the 90s on August 27th. 
And the 26th was the day that the high was 87, if that wasn't clear. Um, after a moderate August 28th, humidity was rolling back on August 29th and 30th. But on August 31st, the month ended rather temperately. Highs were 85 degrees and the low was 69 degrees. So the month opened and closed with highs, uh, I mean with lows in the 60s. And there was a week in the middle with lows also in the 60s. But there were 22 days with lows in the 70s, which was almost an August record. But September would prove to be the end of this. Off the bat, there was a high of 79 and a low of 62 on September 2nd, the chilliest conditions in the city since June 28th. And while September 4th would hit 90 degrees, that would be the last 90 of the year, albeit a lot later than 2021 and 2020, when it would occur on August 27th. Now, as far as lows in the 70s, they would end at the earliest time since 2014, with a low of 73 degrees on Labor Day, September 5th. High that day was 88. September 4th and 5th were the only two days in September with lows in the 70s, and those would be the last lows of the year. By September 6th, temperatures were dropping as rain, but not a lot of it, only 0.78 inches came in. Um, but it was finally some nice consistent rain rather than isolated flash floods, something that we needed for our soil to begin to sponge up. Unfortunately, <coughs> it'll prove to not be enough. Still though, New York City moved through September. It was rather the same temperatures. It was more so the difference in the lows that made it one day feel excessively humid and made the next day feel moderately cool. But you know, the actual aspects of it didn't change that much. But September 16th was the first time in the year where the lows got to below, um, you know, to below 62 degrees. And we finally saw a fall low of 57. So we were finally back in the 50s. My suburb managed to do this feat on September 2nd. Which is the first time it happened in my suburb since June 23rd. But summer would begin to come back to the city when September 19th was well above average with a high of 85 and a low of 68. But of course, Fiona rattled the jet stream, which meant that September 21st would be the last day in the year with a high in the 80s at Central Park. That part's important for a surprising reason. And then there would also seemingly be a last low in the 60s for the rest of the year. Seemingly is the key word. September 22nd had a high of 75 and a low of 57 again. And by September 23rd, we were well below average with a low of 51 and a high of 63. My suburb did manage to make its way up to 66 after bottoming out at 50. And yes, the city would hit 49 degrees on September 24th. Very different story than when we first hit the 40s in 2021 which did not occur until the 18th of October. Um, so, <coughs> after some nice, you know, nice weather, a violent thunderstorm rocked the city on September 25th. And temperatures would gradually deteriorate from there, with conditions worsening out on August 3rd and 4th, with heavy rain, a high of 53, and then 55, and a low of 47, and then 46. So it was about as raw as a day can get, especially in early October. After being stuck in the 50s on October 5th for Yom Kippur, temperatures then shot back up to 74 degrees on um, on October 6th and 76 degrees on October 7th. But here's why the 80s is important. It's not yet. Um, and... It would seem to be that that would be our last gasp of warm air, although the 13th and 14th would provide more highs in the 70s. But again, it didn't feel that way, especially because October 13th was cloudy and rainy enough to force the ALDS game two 
to postpone a day, which actually meant that they lost their rest day when flying back to Cincinnati. I mean, Cleveland. This is the Yankees vs. Guardians um, series. Yankees were victorious, by the way. And there would be one more game postponed on October 17th. So the ALDS actually overlapped with the NLCS between the Phillies and Padres. Phillies were victorious. Um, also, after this bit of weird weather for a little while, October 19th that did drop down to 42 degrees. And I mean, and I mean, it was just like rather unseasonable cool weather for a while. We had a marching band performance at Mitchell Field on October 18th, and it was 48 degrees with wind chills in the mid 40s. For a nighttime performance for three hours, that is exceedingly uncomfortable, and our uniforms did not do much to protect us at all. I was probably wearing the equivalent of what I would wear if I was shoveling snow for an hour in the middle of January in single digit wind chills, but <clears throat> nighttime games in the 40s can be exceptionally uncomfortable. But this cold snap was over by October 21st, and that marching band performance would be better as temperatures would be about 57 degrees at the start of the performance and would end at 52, which was still above 50. And after violent storms nearly ruined our SUNY Stony Brook tour on October 24th, the second college tour to nearly be rained out after SUNY Albany on August 23rd. October 25th and 26th provided both highs in the low 70s and our first low in the 60s in many weeks. <coughs> the low at Ice Slip even broke record. And while there would be more of a cool down to come as October 28th would wind up back in the frosty 40s, it would continue to warm up because the first low in the 40s in November would occur on November 8th. Although in my suburb, we managed to hit a rather cool 43 on the 3rd. Indeed, the city would open up November at 67, 70, 67, 70. But we then have a high, of 60, a high of 76 and a low of 64 on November 5th. A record breaking high of 75 and record tying low of 66 on November 6th, just in time for the New York City Marathon, which, P.S., um, the record tying low happened to be bad luck with November 6th, 2015, because the, high, the, the low was the second warmest low in all of November. And then the high hit 77 degrees on November 7th, which was shockingly not a record. Shocking. Because Bridgeport at 79 and Iceland at 80 managed to hit November highs. By the way, LaGuardia Airport in Newark would also hit the 80s. And that's why I told you that it was important that the 80s would apply specifically at Central Park. But the low that night did drop down to 54 degrees as cooler air moved in. And... Temperatures then bottomed out at 40 degrees on November 9th. But would quickly climb back up because it would be sticky in the upper 60s as Nicole moved through on November 11th. And November 12th would be stuck in the 60s. High of 69, record-breaking low of 60 degrees. But then another round of cooler air moved through on November 13th as temperatures dropped from the low 60s into the low 40s. And for the first time of 2022 in the fall... The low would bottom out in the 30s on November 14th. The second latest date for this first occurrence on record. Um, but then there will be a week of below average conditions before temperatures would begin to moderate in late November. It, it seemed that all of our warmth was seemingly gone. And they weren't wrong because we would only hit the 60s one more time in November on the 27th, and it seemed to be. We could have had our, only our second December after 2005, the other one being 2019, to have December peak only in the 60s. Despite a low of 54 degrees on December 7th, the high could only make its way up to 59. And 
then we enter this bland period of slightly below average temperatures. This is what dragged the summer below normal. But on December 22nd, it managed to buckle up as temperatures then rode their way up from the 30s to, you know, into the 40s and whatever. The high peaked at 58 degrees on December 23rd before crashing down to 8 degrees on December 23rd at night. The biggest spread on record. Temps would drop to 7 degrees on December 24th. And the high 15 would not break the record, but it would at every other metro site in the area, despite highs being 16 or even 17. It was a very chilly Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day would not be that much better, as the high was 28 and the low was 14. The high would be 29 on, on the day after Christmas with a low of 19 degrees. The probably only cold wave of the winter... Highs would then peak out at 35 degrees on the 27th, and oh my god, 47 on the 28th? Yup, we would hit a ceiling 62 degrees on the 30th, before the 31st was again stuck in the 50s. January would not see a single low in the 50s, but it would see a high of 66 degrees come in on January 4th. Um, the low is 49 degrees on January 1st, 2nd, and 4th. On a second, it was warm enough to break the record. Um, and by the way, in case you're wondering about um, January, January would be this month where it wasn't swinging all that much because it only got down to 28 degrees. There were some notable swings, but ultimately January was just on a bland note. Um, what I would mention, if I had to mention something, was how on January... 20 the 13th there was a high of 36 and a low of 38 but that 38 translates to the high on january 14th as it was cloudy windy wind chill stuck in the 20s all day and the low bombed out at 31 the first freeze of 2023 and the afternoon high was only about 36 degrees but that was really it it was um bland super bland and super mild too. January would become the warmest on record in 2023. But all this above average temperatures had to come to an end. On February 1st, the city finally saw 0.4 inches of snow. And the high of 38, low of 26 made it the coldest low since the day after Christmas. As for highs, you know, it, it was equivalent to that of January 14th. And as far as the, you know, mean temperatures below average for the first time since um, December 27th, so two days after Christmas. The day after Boxing Day, if one would say that. <clears throat> While February 2nd would have a high of 40 and a low of 29, temps would drop like a rock on February 3rd from 35 to 11, would fall to 3, which broke records in some areas on February Fourth, but not in Central Park, but would then rise up to 27 by midnight. That would translate to the low on February 5th, as temps would rise to 49. It would freeze one more time during February, but every day since then was below or uh, was above hours until now. And then there was a bunch of days in a row where it wouldn't freeze over. Um, you know. I think that streak might have ended yesterday. It definitely ended today. But, I mean, it was crazy what we saw. And we really buckled up on a ride on February 15th as New York City had a low of 47 and high of 67, neither of which were record-breaking. On February 16th, the high of 70 failed to break a record, although highs of 71 and 68 at Ice and Bridgeport broke monthly records. And it was the first 70s of 2023. Um... But the low of 56 did and was one of the warmest February lows on record. I think it was second warmest low in February on record. <clears throat> Very rare to see this kind of anomalous weather occur in the month of February. But like all good things, it did come to an end on February 17th as temperatures crashed down. Oh my god, this is a 45 minute video of me talking about weather. Did not realize it was going to take this long. I was trying to be concise, but when you talk about 
this long journey. Yes, expect a long video talking about the roller coaster of temperatures that had occurred. Yes, I did make this video in the interest that it could somehow be condensed down to 15 minutes, but sometimes the YouTube world surprises you. And instead, what I got is a 45 minute video, and my phone battery is probably going to be screaming at me.